I'm going to start a minute early because I want to tell a little story. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm going to chair the session. I'm Jonathan Steckel. I, um, I co-founded QD Vision in 2005 and then uh, took a job at Apple in 2014 and have been there um, since. And one of the interesting things that uh, I wanted to just tell a little bit of story about Charlie. Um, you know, as many of you know, Charlie is a, a veteran in the uh, quantum dot industry. And he's, he's been in the quantum dot industry f since the very beginning. He has, um, he had a, you know, a significant position at Quantum Dot Corporation, leading the, the synthesis and development of quantum dots to um, make them water soluble and um, you know, used as, as tagants for, for biomedical and bioimaging applications back in the, in the <clears throat> late 1990s. And he interacted significantly with us at, uh, at MIT. So I was a graduate student in Munji Buendi's lab. And I think one of the interesting little um, little nuggets of, of, uh, of history in terms of quantum dot technology and, and, and the beginning of it all that I wanted to share with you guys today is <clears throat> when, when Seth Coe Sullivan and I were graduate students at MIT and we were working on um, incorporating quantum dot materials into thin films making QD electroluminescent um, devices, we, we were making quantum dots, red, green, blue emitting quantum dots. We were measuring EQEs of uh, you know, 0.5 to 1%, um, we could make RGB, we figured out how to st stamp and print and pattern to try to turn this technology into a display technology. But when we interacted with Charlie, when he was at Quantum Dot Corporation, he came to our lab and we interacted significantly over several years. And the materials that Charlie's group had developed were so unique. They were core shell, cad selenide core, cad zinc sulfide shell, zinc sulfide alloyed structures with these big, thick, graded shells. And the emission efficiency and stability of these materials was outstanding. We had never seen anything like it. And Seth and I basically took these red emitting core shell alloyed structured quantum dots. We, we made QD LEDs out of them, so QD electroluminescent devices out of them. And our EQE doubled, and it, it was 2%, and we were super excited. We were like, whoa, this is amazing. We've never seen anything so efficient. And then at the same time, our, our traditional devices would have to be encapsulated. So we'd make them in a glove box, we'd encapsulate, and then we'd take them out. And if we didn't encapsulate the standard devices, we would see that after measuring the efficiency and running the device <clears throat> in air, after maybe 10, 15 minutes, the device would just die. And, and then when we used Charlie's quantum dots, not only was our EQE double or triple what it, what, what it was with the materials we were making, but the stability was insane. It basically, we could take these devices unencapsulated, run them in the dark lab, and just have them running. And it, they lasted for a day, whereas before they were lasting for minutes. And so it was, it was Charlie's materials that gave Seth and myself the confidence to start QD Vision to say, quantum dot materials are viable for real display applications. They can be made to be stable. They can be made to be extremely efficient. And uh, you know, because of Charlie and, and his development and the materials that he developed in the early days at Quantum Dot Corporation, it basically gave Seth and myself confidence to say, hey, let's, let's, let's start a company. Let's start a company to basically um, you know, try to put QD electroluminescent into display technology. And so that's what, uh, that's what QD Vision was focused on in the early days. So thank you, Charlie, for all the great work that you've done since the early 90s. And he's still in it. He's still in it. He's basically um, moved on from a couple companies since Quantum Dot Corporation, but now at Nanosys for many years, you know, VP, R&D, leading, uh, leading a ton of really great technology development there. So thanks for all your great work in the industry. So welcome. Well, that was the kindest introduction I've ever gotten, I think. Thank you very much, Johnny. So uh, I think you uh, set the stage very well for my talk. Um, <clears throat> what my purpose today is to tell you pretty much in the time I have everything that I know about quantum dots. And uh, 
I'm going to do that in a couple of different ways. The, the thing I want to leave you with is where the technology is today and where it's going. But in order to do that effectively, I think it's really worthwhile reflecting on the history a little bit and see how we got to where we are today. So in terms of an agenda, I'll tell you a little bit, very little bit about who we are, that is Nanosys. I'll tell you a little bit about the history of quantum dots, so some, some more uh, reflections on uh, the kind of things that Johnny was talking about. And then I'll go into uh, a, pr a little deeper dive into what are quantum dots. I want people to understand the basic underlying factors that, in, uh, that deliver the properties that people so like about them. And then I'll go into what are you know, ideal emitter properties I'll then change subject a little bit, talk about display materials, the different types of materials that people use today for displays and the markets that they serve. And then I'll talk about applications. And uh, there are three main application areas. Uh, one is commonplace today and the two are emerging. And then I'll finally wrap up with an outlook, an outlook of what, how the materials are likely to evolve in the, in the near future. So let's get started. So Brief introduction of Nanosys, we're the we're leading supplier of quantum dot materials. We sell to all different kinds of display makers around the world. Uh, from our manufacturing site in Milpitas, we've shipped over 13 tons of quantum dots, something that was unimaginable in the days that Johnny was referring to him a few minutes ago. We have a very large IP patent portfolio in quantum dots because we've been at it for 15 years. And uh, we're about 100 employees and we're in Silicon Valley basically. What we do, we are a materials maker. We manufacture and sell quantum dots. Uh, we believe the best quantum dots in the world. We also design and license display components like QDEF, which you'll hear much more about uh, later in this presentation. And we continue to develop innovative display technologies to grow the, the quantum dot uh, universe of products. So take a step back now, and I'm going to start and tell you what a quantum dot is. So if you don't know anything about quantum dots, this is a good place to pay attention. Otherwise, you can. If you're an expert, you can wait a few slides. So broadly speaking, I think you know, we can talk about three phases of development, a discovery phase, a development phase, and a commercialization phase. I like to think about this basically as a tale of three decades. There was the 90s, which was primarily driven by academic research. A few investigators, mostly in the US, but around the world, uh, really drove and made seminal, seminal improvements to this technology, and I'll talk about those later. There was very little commercial activity in those days. There were some basic problems that had to be resolved. Uh, the early commercialization phase, what's called here the development phase, I think of that as the first decade of the 21st century. Uh, there were some commercial e endeavors at that time, but they were mostly very low volume. Uh, and what happened in the 90s is all of these, the, these few number of uh, leading academics graduated students, graduated postdocs, and they started their own labs. labs. So by the you know, the 2000s, there were actually a lot of people researching quantum dots, and that really accelerated the field. And then starting at about 2010 till now, I call that the era of the display, because that's the key application for quantum dots. It's clear that that's uh, much more important than any of the other applications that have been uh, studied to date, and we're still in the midst of that, and it's showing no signs of, of letting up. So what are quantum dots? Basically, they're small particles of semiconductor material. And they exhibit typically as coarse shell structures. And the most important thing about them is they exhibit a property known as quantum confinement. So here's a diagram on the left of, uh, of a quantum dot and a transmission electron micrograph on the right, uh, which is showing you know, basically the individual columns of atoms. So typically, these things have you know, hundreds to thousands of atoms in there. So they're small crystals, perfect crystals. Um, so, because of that, of that number of atoms, they're basically larger than small molecules like water or other molecules, <laughs> the typical small molecules, and they're smaller than large molecules like DNA or something, but, you know, still molecular in size. So, let's go back to your college chemistry or physics course and try to remember a few key points here. Starting on the right with a molecule, you know, the molecule atoms come together, or molecules come together uh, and create uh, molecular orbitals. There's HOMO, or highest occupied molecular orbital, typically filled with electrons, and empty states called the LUMO, lowest unoccupied. And they're separated by an energy that takes to promote an electron from one to the other. Change the uh, 
the concept is the same, but changing the, the, the word slightly. In the, in, the, in the vernacular of semiconductors, you have the valence band, a continuum of bands, and a conduction band, a continuum of bands. The valence band filled with electrons, a conduction band empty, with an energy between them. And, uh, and uh, this, this, band, this energy is called the band gap energy. Quantum dot is in between those two systems. It, it, has more states than a small molecule because it has many more atoms, but it doesn't have this continuous band like, uh, like bulk semiconductors do. That gives it some unique properties. And one other thing that's important uh, is a terminology that I'll use throughout this talk is if you give a quantum dot, or for that matter, a semiconductor or a molecule energy enough to promote an electron from the valence band to the conduction band, that excited state's called an exciton. Okay, so we'll refer to that term. Uh, many times. So let's, let's talk a little bit more about this exciton. So if, we, if a quantum dot, or another semiconductor for that matter, uh, absorbs either a photon, or later we'll talk about absorbs a charge, uh, an electron is promoted into these higher energy bands, into the conduction band. And uh, when that can very quickly relax to the lowest state of the uh, conduction band, that happens on a very fast time scale. And then ultimately drops back down to the ground state, emitting a photon of light. That's characteristic of that band gap. So that's what happens when an exciton forms and then recombines. And when that light is given off, you get emission of light, and it's looking at the uh, spectra on the right-hand side. You can see that they're very symmetrical. That's one of the desirable properties about quantum dots, is they have very narrow symmetric emission spectra. That's very useful in display technologies for, for producing color. But if we look at this a little bit more, you can quickly see two figures of merit, or we can talk about two figures of merit that we, could, that we would use to judge the effectiveness of an emitter. So the first thing we could ask is, if a, if a light is absorbed, uh, if, a if, a, if a photon is absorbed, what percentage of the photons that are absorbed are re-emitted? So compared to every blue event, how, much, uh, uh, how many red events do you get? For an emitter, you want that to be very high. And so that's typically very high for quantum dots. It, needs to be over 90% to be really a, a, a decent emitter. So that's called the photoluminescence quantum yield. The other question you could ask for a figure of merit is, at the time of that absorption event, the blue line, how long does it take before the, the emission occurs? And uh, that's called the radiative lifetime. And you want that to be short as possible, because it's important that uh, you can cycle these through these emissive states very quickly. So a more effective emitter has a shorter lifetime. However, the most thing that people seem to know about quantum is probably their most important property is this property of, of quantum confinement. So if we look at the uh, bulk semiconductor band structure on the left, and we see a valence band, a conduction band, and a band gap, um, that's a, that band gap is a, is a fixed number associated with any given semiconductor. And if you, you know, go to Wikipedia, you look up silicon or gallium arsenide or something, it's, there's a number associated with that. It's an invariant with size. That is until you compress the size of this very, very small, and you get to this very small size regime below what's called the Bohr radius. That's typically around 10 nanometers, but it varies with semiconductors. But when you get below this level, uh, you're basically forcing this exciton, this excited state, electron hole pair is what it actually is, contained within this dot, to occupy a volume smaller than it would otherwise normally occupy. And that, there's an energy cost associated with that. So if you start on the left with a bulk semiconductor, you see it has a particular band gap. All of a sudden, we make the particle that it resides in smaller and smaller, and we exceed the Bohr radius, or we get below the Bohr radius. You see the band gap gets larger. We make it a little smaller yet, larger, and so forth. So there's this size-dependent energy that's really important. This is the gives, the gives rise to the tunability, which makes quantum dots so very useful in displays. Okay, so that's basically how quantum dots work. Um, as usual, the, the real story is somewhat trickier than that or more complicated. Well, it turns out that just having a little piece of semiconductor material uh, that has, uh, you know, a couple thousand atoms and many, a high percentage of those atoms are on the surface, doesn't really have very good optical properties. And a key discovery in the 1990s was, if you make a core shell material, that is, you take a semiconductor particle, and you put another semiconductor on the outside of it that has a higher band gap, 
that passivates all these dangling bonds that would otherwise be the termination of that semiconductor, which lead to bad optical properties, and corrects them. So uh, if you look at the diagram in the middle, we see that, uh, in this case, the core would be on the left, smaller band gap, and uh, a larger band gap material around it, forming the shell. And the other thing that makes this somewhat tricky is it's important that the shell grows on the core in an epitaxial fashion, meaning the crystal structure of the core is adopted by the shell and it, it can accommodate that crystal structure. So not any material can be used as a shell material. It has to sort of match the core uh, lattice constants or, or, or basically the, the size of the core uh, lattice. And the other thing, too, is that uh, the, that's not the end of the story either. The, 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 the re ugly reality is that there's more than that. There are ligands on the outside of the shell. This is for a number of reasons. Again, still passivation is required. These are very small particles. Uh, they exhibit quantum effects, and so even though the, the shell well insulates the core, it does not completely do so, and so there are still electronic effects felt at the surface of the shell. Uh, these ligands help passivate that. The ligands also provide processivity, which is important for how these are being made, and I'll talk about that a little later. Well, back in the 90s, when what the time Johnny was referring to, uh, the early synthesis of cadmium selenide, which was the first material that I'm going I'm to basically talk about two materials today, cadmium selenide and indium phosphide, otherwise known as CAD-free. And uh, so let's, let's talk about cadmium selenide a little bit. It was originally made from toxic organometallic precursors. It was difficult to synthesize. Uh, in fact, you can look on YouTube and find videos of the old synthesis of cadmium selenide. Basically, you took a liquid dimethyl cadmium, extremely toxic, and injected it very quickly into 300 degree solvent. And I don't want to say too much about it other than I would, if I had one word to describe it, I'd call it sporting. Uh, but uh, it was dangerous and really prevented the scalability. And uh, around the end of the 90s, uh, people discovered ionic chemistry. They realized that this was just redox chemistry. It became very simple to basically use much more stable precursors and safe conditions to, to do these syntheses, which enabled uh, scaling up. Also, the early shell development, as Johnny referred to, was insufficient. Uh, the old shell chemistry was done with using very reactive reagents at fairly lowish, lower temperatures, and uh, that prevented really good crystallinity and coverage of the shell on the core, and so that was replaced with higher temperature chemistry, and that really improved that, uh, the sh quality of shells. And so these really led to the ability to scale this. So why is this colloidal stuff, the ligands, all that, why is that important? Um, so let's take a step back and somebody ask you, what would it take to develop a precision optical semiconductor component? You'd say, well, I need to go to a fab, I need to get wafers and stuff like that. Well, if you're going to make quantum dots that way, and you could, assuming you could make them that way, and you could make them end-to-end -end on a wafer, you'd still need about 50 square meters of wafer to make a gram of quantum dots. So no way would this technology be in the marketplace today if that's the way, that was the way you had to make them. So this is a really important factor that you can make these using chemical production equipment, which has been around for decades, maybe a century, and uh, can make them in very large volume and, you know, and still end up with really high quality optical properties. So I think this is oftentimes overlooked, this aspect of, of, of quantum dot development. So beginning around the year 2000, we started to see, uh, and as Johnny mentioned, I worked in, in some of these areas, you know, biological labels, photovoltaics. Um, because quantum, dot can make, quantum dots can make so many discrete colors, people looked at uh, multiplexing by color for a variety of different purposes, uh, sensors, catalysts, all kinds of things. Um, even as early as, I, th I think I can remember back to 2003, uh, display people would come to the, the company that I was working at at the time interested in this. They saw the promise, but it was still a long way away in terms of ability to scale and the, 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 the optical properties that were ne necessary for, for the display industry. So now I'm going to change from the uh, introduction section a little bit to talking a little bit about color and how th the quantum dot properties really lead to the, uh, what's needed in displays for color performance. So probably the most important thing that I think people recognize for quantum dots is tunability. Um, that you can use, I mean, if, 
what's the alternative? If you're going to make a, if you're going to use a phosphor or something like that, you might have a phosphor that emits at a desirable wavelength. But if you want to shift it one way or another, there's no guarantee that you can make a material that will do that effectively. With quantum dots, that's not that hard. It's not always as easy as people think either, but it's, it's certainly possible to, to shift the wavelength very small amounts precisely, with, you know, and, and reproducibly. And so that's really important as color gamuts change. Sometimes display makers are targeting one color space or another, and maybe they want to do a hybrid where they want to kind of maximize the, the gamut of two different, two different color gamuts. You know, this is where tunability really becomes useful. Furthermore, um, they have high brightness. Their emissive properties are very good, so are their absorptive properties. That means they're effective emitters. And because of this narrow emission, uh, this, which we'll talk about a little more later, uh, you can get high purity color. It's important that you have a narrow, a very discrete color if you want to get high color gamut. And high stability. I mean, these displays with quantum dots have now been around for five years, and uh, I think nobody's noticing that, uh, that they're dying or burning out or anything like that. So they, they inherently have pretty high stability when they're, when they're made correctly. So let's talk a little bit more about color. I think probably this audience understands uh, what a CIE diagram is, basically all the colors that the eye can see with the monochromatic wavelengths of light around the perimeter. Uh, the points within it are called pointer's gamut. The pointer in 1980 basically just measured reflected light off objects found in nature, and these were the, these were the, uh, the colors that, uh, that he was able to observe. So, you know, obviously you'd like a display to faithfully represent the colors that are commonly found in nature. And uh, there are many, many different color gamuts. I'm not going to talk about all of them. I'm going to talk about two that are common today, I think. It's, one is DCIP3. It's not really a formal standard, but it's a sort of a voluntary standard uh, introduced by the motion picture industry. It covers about 85% of pointer's gamut. And uh, you'll notice that many display makers today are, are specking against this standard, typically, you know, some high 90s percentage of, uh, of DCIP3 color space. However, last year, a new formal standard was introduced, uh, BT2020, and uh, that's, that's more, a more challenging standard for, for color because it, well, basically it does cover about 100% of pointer's gamut, which is, which, is, which is very good, and it's part of the larger UHD TV standard that uh, incorporates other aspects of, 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 of viewing, not just color. But currently, only really you know, rare high-end type of displays can, can can produce 100% of BT2020 today. Uh, with, with quantum dot displays, uh, typically you can get to just over 90% uh, BT2020. <clears throat> so that's color. That's one dimension of, I think, what's important in displays and why quantum dots uh, play an important role. Uh, the other is brightness. And uh, you know, if you look on the left, you can see that, and I think we're all aware that our eye has incredible dynamic range. It's huge from very dimmest, dimmest number of photons to bright sunlight. And I think we also know that uh, it's driven primarily by two different receptors in our eye, cones, which are, are uh, at, used at higher brightness levels and are more sensitive to color and rods, which have color sensitivity but much less and are mainly used in low ambient, uh, low ambient light conditions. But at any one time, um, you know, the, the eye only has a limited dynamic range, smaller than that, st still quite large, as, as shown by this light blue uh, pentagon, I guess it is. And you can see that if you look at display uh, brightness levels or ranges, you know, they still don't really span that. And ideally, you'd like them to, to exceed that. So, so brightness is really important in display, not simply color. Um, oftentimes, contrast ratio is, is discussed as a key uh, figure of merit. And uh, contrast ratio is important, basically the brightest that a display can emit to the black level. And for, you know, like certain Televisions like, uh, like an OLED TV, which have fabulous black levels, uh, they really shine in low light conditions. But in real world, in real world uh, type display, app, uh, display environments, uh, brightness matters a lot too. And so it's important to be able to, the display to be able to also put out a lot of, uh, a lot of lumens too. Uh, finally, uh, this kind of brings us to the, the, the concept of, of color volume. Uh, I think this term was introduced by Dolby, but I think it's pretty commonplace today. Um, basically, rather than look at the CIE diagram as a two-dimensional entity, but looking at what 
what intensity can be displayed by each one of those colors. And obviously, uh, you want to be able to have that color volume be as large as possible and not very quickly pyramid to, uh, to at fairly low levels of intensity. And, and that's important because whether you're looking at something, whether it's lava as shown here, fire, or whatever it is, your, your emotional response to it is not just that it's orange, it's also its intensity level. So it's important that both of those, uh, color and intensity, are, are, are represented by the display. And even in sort of common you know, images, you still see a huge range of intensities, uh, as shown here, from you know, 100 nits to over 10,000. So now I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about uh, the materials that are used in displays, the quantum dot materials used in displays, and the markets that they serve. So uh, let me uh, move into that. Um, you know, the first cadmium selenide displays <coughs> excuse me, were, uh, were launched by Nanosys and QD Vision in 2013. And you know, speaking to colleagues in, in other, in, in other uh, companies, uh, it was clear that there were other companies also working on cadmium selenide displays uh, during, during this time period, and uh, they chose not to release a product uh, despite being permitted to do so uh, with a regulatory exemption. I'm going to spend a, a second or two talking about that. So uh, this is this Rojas regulation of hazardous materials. Rojas is a European directive. Um, it only applies in Europe, but typically it's other... other uh, uh, geographies adhere to this as well. ROHAS, R-O-H-S, means restriction on hazardous substances or restri restriction of hazardous substances. And basically in 2012, they, they created an exemption for cadmium in, in displays. And I think the thinking was, okay, we're, if we put this exemption in place, we're risking cadmium in the environment, but on the other hand, displays are more efficient, so less energy use. And anyway, so I'm not sure exactly what the, what the calculus was, but something along those lines. And and certainly at, at the, in, 20, in 2012, they permitted uh, cadmium to go up to basically the equivalent of about 100,000 ppm. Some enormous amount of, of cadmium was, was permitted in displays for this specific purpose. And uh, that expired in 2014. It was, it was supposed to be a, a, a two-year period, as I recall. And uh, you know, like good government agencies, they got right working on that. And in, August of 2017, they uh, came up with a renewal of it, um, and uh, that happened just sort of last year. And they did renew it, but at 2,000 ppm, it's much lower than that astronomical 100,000 number that it was prior to that. And that uh, goes until uh, October of 2019, so end of next year. And at that point, it'll either be renewed again, or it won't be renewed, in which case there's an 18-month sunset period. So uh, cadmium in displays after May of 2021 will have to be at the uh, un unexempted limit, which is 100 ppm. So I think an important footnote to that is that um, there, the European Commission has been clear about what this means. And they said, you know, for cadmium, there must be less than 0.01%, that's essentially 100 ppm, of the substance by raw uh, weight at the raw homogeneous materials level. So this basically means it's just the material that you're adding that has cadmium that can be considered in this calculation. You can't consider all these other adhesives, films, display components that, you know, that would basically make the denominator that larger. You can't really do that. So um, it's a high bar to meet, and so uh, I, I think it's, it's important to recognize that. So moving forward in time, um, the first CAD-free display was uh, launched by Samsung in uh, 2015, branded SUHD TV. It was rebranded in 2017 as QLED TV, much to the chagrin of the people working on electroluminescent devices, which I'll talk about later. But it was a, it was a real uh, step forward to be able to, to make uh, a, a, a television, a display based on indium phosphide, which had really lagged cadmium selenide in properties for so very long a time. So talk a little bit about the market. I think people in this room are well aware of this. LCD dominates the display market and uh, is, for, <laughs> is going to do so for the foreseeable future. So, uh, you know, I think that's a couple of reasons, of course. One is the huge installed base of LCD infrastructure. The second is, um, uh, what is the second? Uh, uh, oh, I, I, the other is that the LCD manufacturers continue to innovate. And, uh, you know, 
through quantum dots, through a lot of different means, have really upped the game for an LCD. LCD TV today is just so much better than it was even five or 10 years ago. And the part of the market that the quantum dot materials serve, the wide color gamut market, that's growing, the, that's the fastest growing part of this market, so 50% uh, uh, year over year growth. And Specifically, Nanosys products using our technology is growing as well. And uh, this last number is just through the first half of this year. So, so there's no question that this, mater this material system is being adopted uh, in the marketplace. And uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see what limits it. And maybe it's going to be out, out uh, maybe it's going to be substituted by more modern versions of, uh, of these QD products. So let me get it. <clears throat> So next I'm going to talk about uh, display applications, and I'll talk about three, three different ways quantum dots are integrated into TVs. <clears throat> so the first we'll call, uh, we call photo enhanced. It's basically LCD backlight technology. It's what's in the market today. We'll talk about that at, at length. Um, coming not far behind, photo emissive technology. This is still photoluminescence color conversion technology like the backlight technology is. However, it's moved to the front of the display and uh, basically at the pixel level and so therefore it has to be patterned. And a little further off than that is what we call electroemissive or quantum dot electroluminescence. And this is basically using quantum dots as emitters in electroluminescent devices. So the quantum dot equivalent of, a, of an OLED. So let's start with uh, photo enhanced. So this is uh, basically an LCD set that has uh, quantum dot enhancement film. Uh, you see that there's a QDEF sheet in the back of the in the back of the device, and you see that the, the light is coming is blue. And this is how the all the quantum dot TVs today are enabled. Have give high color gamut, high brightness, you know, very much reliability, high reliability, and leverages all this infrastructure that exists today in the in the market. Going into a little more detail, so this is the actual optical component. It's basically red and green quantum dots in a, in a polymer matrix, a resin, that's cured between two sheets of barrier film. And uh, barrier film prevents ingress of moisture and oxygen, and this resin layer, the thickness of the QD layer is somewhere between 10 and 100 microns. So basically, if you shine blue light on one side of this film, out the other side comes RGB light. Okay, so now I want to, this is show up pretty well, I guess. Talk about this slide. It's a little bit complicated. There's a lot of things represented on this slide. The, the big areas of, the, uh, of this spectrum, the red, the blue, and the green, are approximate locations of, of color filters that are commonly found in, in LCD sets. <clears throat> The, the gray line is the white LED spectrum. The, it's basically a blue LED plus a YAG phosphor that, uh, that is used to generate white light in a standard TV set. And uh, you can see that, that the green emission, there's green emission throughout the green color filter, all the way from sort of the turquoise to, to, to yellow. And then the red, the intensity is very much on the green edge of the red, the orange edge. And uh, so it's, you can see that that's not a very, very good way for generating RGB light. Uh, on the other hand, take the quantum dot emissions. If we remove the white LED from the set and replace it with the blue LED without the egg phosphor and use a red and a green quantum dot emission, you can see that there's much better in-band transmission, much more discrete wavelengths of light from the quantum dot. And this is what makes uh, this quantum dot, uh, uh, this photo enhanced approach so useful in LCD displays. So, uh, so Nanosys had a program to make uh, what was what we called the quantum rail in the 2008 to 10 time frame, and it had really nice properties, uh, operating lifetime, brightness, color uniformity, and basically the idea was to uh, use blue LEDs and a glass capillary and put it on it up against the light guide plate, and it was used from, uh, the idea was to use it for mobile applications. Uh, QD Vision actually commercialized this, but it wasn't without headaches for both companies. Uh, basically, there are problems. There are dimensional changes in the resin when it cures. There are bubbles that can form. 
And, you know, again, this is an optical component. It has to be almost perfect. And uh, so defect rate was high, and uh, uh, Nanosys went away from this, but uh, I think QD Vision actually got it working for a number of products. But what, what we went to work on after that was quantum dot enhancement film, and that, that was a much better implementation of this, and it delivered all the project, all the, um, all the performance of the rail, but uh, without this difficulty in integration. There were difficulties just mechanically integrating this rail, just to get it lined up and uh, to keep it in place. And why this is so much better for manufacturers, it's really a drop-in solution. If you're a display manufacturer and you want to use quantum dot enhancement film, basically you take out the white LEDs in your set, you put in blue LEDs, and then you take out a diffuser sheet and you put in the quantum dot enhancement film, and that's it. So, you know, there's no capital investment. Uh, it's basically just a component switch. And so this, I think, has really driven the adoption of this technology in, in the display market. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, we talked briefly about the first cadmium-based display and the first cadmium-free display. Um, let's talk a little bit about the differences in, in these materials. So on the, the, the graph on the, on the left, I show four spectra, two red, two green. In both cases, the narrower spectrum is cadmium selenide, and the broader spectrum is indium phosphide, what people typically refer as CAD-free. And uh, the reason that uh, people liked cadmium selenide so much is it makes these very narrow emission peaks, and uh, it's easy to make. There are just a lot of reasons. And for a long time, the performance was far better, but uh, indium phosphide has caught up, caught up in recent years. But uh, as, you, as you know, uh, based on the Rojas exemption, there is some possibility of this uh, technology just going away. And so nanosys scientists were looking at this and trying to figure out what, what could be done about it. And if we look at the graph on the right, we, we were looking at the impact of, of full width half max, which is on the, the bottom axis, the x-axis. And from left to right on that axis, basically the spectrum is getting broader and broader. And then we look at color gamut coverage on the y-axis. Don't worry about the absolute values here. This was taken with a kind of an old uh, set of color filters, but I think the, uh, the impact is the same in both cases. As you move to broader and broader emission spectra, you see that red maintains color gamut longer, quite a bit longer, than green does. So what that says is if you want to maintain high color gamut, you can do it with a narrow green and a, you know, and a less, a, a more a broadly emitting red spectrum. And so this was the uh, genesis of the Hyperion quantum dot product that uh, we put together at Nanosys. They, the, the challenge was figuring out a material system that could use both the cadmium selenide and indium phosphide together. So what was actually done is the scientists figured out a way to engineer a very low cadmium green product, and then using that with a cadmium free red, we're able to both reach greater than 90% BT 2020 gamut coverage and be under this 100 ppm threshold for, uh, for Rojas exemption. So this can be used even if the exemption goes away completely. Uh, we introduced this last year here at SID, and uh, we and our partners at Hitachi Chemical won the Display Component of the Year Award for this, so we're very happy about that. So if you look at where we've ended up with this, uh, basically we have cadmium-based cadmium products based on 100% uh, cadmium selenide addressing all of the different color gamuts. Uh, we have our Hyperion product, which is uh, Rojas compliant, and we also sell cadmium-free indium phosphide products. And we not only use those in quantum dot enhancement film, but we exclusively use those in all future applications, and I'll mention why that is the case uh, later. However, we are unable to hit 90% BT2020 gamut coverage with the CAD-free. That's the case today. Um, based on improvements in the CAD-free technology that we've made, as well as improvements in wide color gamut filters, we actually think we can hit 90% uh, BT2020 with a green that's 33 nanometers full half max and red that's 35. We're currently at 34 for green and uh, about 35 for red. So we're actually very uh, bullish about being able to ultimately get to this uh, milestone with uh, an entirely CAD-free system. Well, what else does the industry want? Well, they want lower cost. <laughs> In fact, that's been the case since we started this. Since 2013, there's been an average price reduction of 30% year over year on the cost of uh, quantum dot enhancement film. 
still, you know, they want to keep that trend going. Uh, so one of the ways is to integrate quantum dots directly into the panel. And uh, I'll, I'll show uh, an example of that on the next slide. And uh, so we'll talk about that then. Uh, barrier film cost reduction. This is an incredibly expensive part of this construction. Barrier film costs more than the quantum dots. And so one way to get around that is to engineer the quantum dots to be more stable so you don't need such a high level of, of, of protection. And so we've already reduced that significantly. We're about 10 to the minus 2 now or a little less. If we can get that even further, we basically can go barrierless and then it will be very low cost. Finally, uh, we made improvements to the formulation that have reduced the number of quantum dots we need on an area basis, so that reduces cost for the customer, as well as just volume. You know, by selling more and more of this, we get economies of scale. So a lot of reasons why costs can come down further. One thing I wanted to mention, uh, uh, another, uh, another implementation of this uh, photo-enhanced technology, we call it quantum dot on glass, or QDOG. Basically, this uses this iris glass, which is a very thin glass light guide plate. Uh, quantum dots can be coated directly on it and then encapsulated, so it enables a much thinner, a thinner display and you know, basically all the properties of, uh, of, of quantum dots on that. So now I'm going to go into the next phase of this, which is the photoemissive technology. And this is this is none of the, these next two areas are not on the market today. And <clears throat> all of the technology from here on out is all CAD free. Our perspective, for, first of all, because of this homogeneous uh, description in the Rojas uh, rules, there's basically no way you can make either the photoemissive or electroemissive in a cadmium based product because the homogeneous layer is basically 100% quantum dots. And if, there any, if there's any cadmium in there, it's going to be too much. So the basis of all of our future development today, and actually has been the case for the last few years, is entirely CAD free. So I'm not going to talk about the photo emissive pixel level. There are two different ways to accomplish this, two technology uh, routes to accomplish this, and lots of different application areas. So I'll talk about all of that in this section. <clears throat> so again, instead of creating red and green RGB light in the back. In the backlight, the backlight is just producing, in this case, in this LCD implementation, just blue light, and there's color conversion at the pixel level. And so the benefit of this is, of course, that you could have much greater uh, light output, a better viewing angle, much more like a, an OLED set or any other type of emissive architecture. And uh, there's you know, two different technologies that potentially can be used to, to accomplish this. Uh, again, comparing this to the an enhancement, uh, photo enhanced case on the top, again, blue in the backlight converts it to RGB light, and then color filters basically subtract away the light, the, the light that you don't want. So it's, you know, in principle, you know, a lossy system. The, the, the idea behind the photo emissive approach is the con color conversion takes place at the pixel, so you're converting the blue light to the wavelengths that you like and not, uh, not uh, subtracting them away. So, you know, you can either have greater luminance or greater efficiency at the same luminance is, is, is the belief. The other thing, of course, is that uh, we're well aware of the angular dependence of light in an LCD display. This kind of removes that constraint. For, for implementing, though, in, a, in an LCD, of course, there's this issue of uh, polarization because you have this isotropic QD emitter at the front, and uh, this requires a, in, a polarizer in cell in the LCD and uh, this is challenging, and so uh, a number of groups have been working on this, made a lot of great progress. Uh, I don't think it's ready for commercialization just yet, but I, I think people continue to, uh, to innovate in this area. So what's important for um, this uh, photoemissive approach? Um, people think that the big deal with quantum dots is, well, they have to be really, they have to have a really high quantum yield. Well, they do already. And pretty much all the Commercial quantum, yield, commercial quantum dots today have quantum yields, quantum efficiencies over 90%. So that isn't the issue. The big issue with, with, the, with in particular, with the CAD-free materials, which we're using, is shown in the, in the graph on the left, which is the absorption spectrum of green, and, uh, green cadmium selenide and green indium phosphide. And you can see that the cadmium selenide absorbs at 450 nanometer light about more than twice as much as indium phosphide. This is the big difference in performance between these two materials. It's, and it's a, it's a major issue. I mean, the, the 
the problem is that, of course, you need to have circa 450 nanometer blue light in a, in a, in a, in a display, and so there's, that's pretty much where you have to excite it, and that just happens to be a really bad place for indium phosphide. Still, uh, changes to the structure of the quantum dots, kind of like uh, what Johnny was referring to earlier, enable you to sort of adjust the absorption at any particular wavelength. And that's, that's really the work that's going on now, and it's nowhere near uh, two to one difference anymore, but there's still not parity, and this, this needs, to, needs to happen. For red, it's not such an issue. Red has fairly high absorption at 450, so it's, it's not, not really an issue. It's really an issue for, for green. So, using that, uh, at Nanosys, this is a demo that we created last year. It's, we're not experts at photolithography, but uh, we were, it shows that we're able to make uh, quantum dot photoresist, both red and green, and pattern them on a, uh, on a glass slide. And uh, so, these are, again, cadmium-free materials processed in air, exposed to the same type of high temperature baking, 180 degrees, uh, development, et cetera. So, and the materials at the end have high stability, stability adequate for a commercial product, uh, tested to 30, over 30,000 hours. Um, again, what, what was done is basically the quantum dots were dispersed in a resin that had a photo initiator and a thermal cure component, so you could do this two-stage patterning and, and, uh, and removal and final curing. And, uh, you know, there's potential for substantial luminance and gamut increase with this approach if, and if, this is a big if, you can control the blue light leakage. So this is where that absorption comes in so handy. The, the, if you look at the QDEF, this is the traditional LCD problem. You have leakage from the color filters from one into another. And uh, that isn't a problem with this approach. The problem is that you're exciting all of these pixels with blue light. If any blue light comes through the red or the green channel, that's color contamination that reduces gamut. So it's really important to get the absorption up so that essentially 100% of the blue light is absorbed, or you have to manage it another way by having a blue blocking filter. So one, one way or the other, one way or the other, you have to control that if you want to achieve high color gamut coverage. <clears throat> so uh, so another way to, to make material other than photoresistive through inkjet, and this uh, work is uh, through our partners at DIC uh, Corporation in Japan. Uh, they have two approaches, a solvent-based and a solvent-free approach. Um, with the solvent-based approach, uh, you can get maybe a higher loading of, of QDs in, the, in it, but, uh, you know, you have the solvent evaporation, which ultimately uh, gives you a thinner film. In the solvent-free uh, approach, uh, you maybe don't have quite as high of a loading, but 100% of the material is retained. Um, DIC is doing, you know, really fabulous work on this, as I'll show in the next couple of slides, and they're currently sampling these inks to customers and expect to be in uh, production in 2020. Now, here's some examples of uh, materials that they've printed, uh, yeah, 80 micron pixel size, and one of the nice things you can see is, in the case of these, you see the nice, uh, broad, uh, an, you know, lack of angular dependence on emission that you'd expect to see from an emissive display, so really nice. And uh, here's, here's another example of an RGB demo, and if, if you want, you can come and see this at uh, Nanosys booth. Um, the uh, thickness is uh, around, uh, around 10 microns. Again, not just LCD, any kind of blue uh, excitation display can be used, uh, so you could use a, a blue OLED or blue micro LED to, uh, to excite you know, red or green quantum dot pixels. Um, you know, the idea is that, you know, you'd have the perfect black level of, of the display, of, of either of those displays, but, you know, the color of, of, of quantum dots. Uh, we have a collaborator that's working, we're working with on micro LEDs. I mean, those of you, many of you probably know, micro LEDs would be an ideal display if they could be made. I mean, uh, ideal semiconductor emitter for each color. Uh, it would, you know, it, it would be very, very nice to have. Unfortunately, from a manufacturing perspective, it's incredibly complex. Whether you try to make an RGB display or pick and place individually made uh, pixels, uh, though, on the other hand, if you could make a, a RGB or a, I'm sorry, a, a, a blue uh, matrix of, of uh, a blue array and just color code uh, color the pixels red or, or green with quantum dots be a way to make a, a very stable, uh, you know, colorful display 
uh, presumably much more cheaply. And so you can see our collaborators have got this working much better than we have, got down to three micron pixel patterning with, uh, with, uh, with a photoresist approach. So if you have to decide uh, if you want to use photoresist, you know, if you need very small features, you pretty much have to do that. Inkjet printing can't get to sub five micron. Uh, also with photoresist, you know, most fab manufacturer, most display manufacturers have the photolithography capability already today. Uh, for inkjet, it's much more material efficient. You only put it where you want it. And, uh, you know, you can formulate these to higher loading as well. So there are a number of reasons why you might pick one or the other. So I'm going to switch gears now and talk about uh, the final topic, which is, I think, the future of quantum dot displays. What we call electroemissive, or quantum dot QDEL. We don't call it QLED anymore. Um, so, uh, you know, this really holds the promise for quantum dots. I mean, have all the benefits of quantum dots, the color, the stability, brightness, with all of the benefits of OLED, which is, you know, incredibly low black levels, great viewing angle, all this. So, you know, that's maybe, maybe the holy grail, and you know, let's, let's talk about that. It's, it's very much like an OLED, basically you have two electrodes and you have an emissive layer. Uh, usually it's a number of layers, but uh, basically the idea is to get charges into the quantum dots instead of photons so that they can produce ex excitons and give off uh, light. And the idea uh, I think I just stated everything on this slide, so. How do they work? <clears throat> uh, basically, just like an OLED, you have uh, charge transport layers for holes and electrons feeding the quantum dot, and you, pr you basically are creating excitons through the charge injection as opposed to photon injection. It's the only difference, very much like an OLED. So how, would, how, do, these, how do these stand up to OLEDs? How might you think about them versus an OLED? So let's, let's, let's think about efficiency first. Let's think about power efficiency. So basically, how many watts of energy you put in versus how many, how many watts of light you get out. Power efficiency is usually called EQE, external quantum efficiency. And it's a product of two things. The IQE, internal quantum efficiency, meaning how much light actually is produced per watt of input energy in the device, and then how much light can get out. That's the outcoupling efficiency. So if we just look at outcoupling efficiency, the, the dimensions and the materials aren't that different in a quantum dot LED and an OLED. And so you'd probably expect the outcoupling efficiency to be about the same. That is unless you could somehow orient the, the materials to get preferred emission in one plane. That's possible with some quantum dot heterostructures like rods. Uh, it's, it's possible with some types of organic emitters, uh, if anybody was at the talk this morning, too. So at a, at a first blush, you'd say, from a point of view of outcoupling efficiency, you don't expect quantum dot electroluminescent devices to be any different than OLEDs. Now let's examine the other parameter, IQE. That's made up of a, a couple of different terms. The first is a, a recombination efficiency, or the fraction of charges that result in excitons. Uh, a fair amount of work has been going, gone into this in a lot of groups. I, I don't think they're exactly equal today, but based on the knowledge that exists today, I don't think there's any reason that's emerged why you'd think that that, that efficiency would be any different between an OLED and a quantum dot LED. The other, another factor, this chi, the probability of radiative emission, this is basically from quantum mechanical selection rules. Uh, we also heard a little bit about that this morning, uh, the difference between singlet and triplet emitters. Uh, that's, this is why phosphorescent OLEDs are inherently more efficient than fluorescent OLEDs, because they emit from a triplet state. Well, quantum dots emit from a triplet state as well. So again, you'd expect the benefits that you'd see from like a phosphorescent OLED with quantum dots. You wouldn't a priori think that there's any reason why they would be less efficient. And photoluminescent quantum efficiency, uh, typically they're very high for quantum dots. Now, in the device environment, things could change. But the summary of the slide is, Looking at from an efficiency perspective, you really expect quantum dots to be just as efficient as OLEDs if, if they were you know, equally well developed. So let's look at that a little bit further. What are some of the issues today? If we look at these two energy diagrams for an OLED and a quantum dot electroluminescent device, um, you know, one of the issues is that there's been a huge amount of effort that's gone into developing charge transport layers for OLEDs. 
and not the same effort that's, that's gone in for, for quantum dots. And because the bands are, are higher, closer to vacuum for quantum dots, this, this actually, you know, these materials aren't really just right. And so if we see one, two, and three on here, <clears throat> these, these numbers in the squares, we can see that in the case of one, there's sort of a, a, a charge injection barrier for holes, similarly for two for electrons. And, and another problem with that is once you're able to get electrons into the emissive layer, the quantum dot layer, you have this problem where they can potentially hop over into the hole transport layers and, and not recombine in the, in the QD. So what, you, what we'd ideally like is sort of electron blocking there. So again, this means that further work has to go into developing these materials, but these aren't, uh, these aren't impossible tasks. These are, these are optimization. If we look at uh, efficiency milestones, I have to apologize to Professor Lee for stealing his slide, but uh, it had all the information I wanted on it, and you know, uh, so anyway, this is his slide. But uh, you can see that great progress has been uh, made in in quantum dot, uh, you know, device development. Uh, you, all, pretty much most of the ones on this uh, slide are cadmium-based materials. Uh, but you can see the stars are, are cadmium-free, and you see they're all exceeding, you know, fluorescent OLED typical efficiencies, and really, in a lot of cases, approaching or exceeding phosphorescent OLED efficiencies. So, I mean, if you consider that the commercial requirement today in a display is around 15 percent, you know, the quantum dot LEDs are basically there. So, uh, this 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 isn't the problem. <clears throat> Here's. Uh, I could show you data for, uh, from a lot of different groups. Uh, this one I've shown is from TCL, and I show it because it's a, it's a fairly complete, oftentimes uh, groups don't uh, report on all the colors or they don't report on all, a lifetime or anything. So here what TCL shown is they're basically over 15% EQE for red, green, and blue, and they shown the lifetime. And uh, I think the thing that your eye catches the most is the lifetime for blue. Now, this isn't just a TCL problem, this is an industry problem. This is the big problem with quantum dot LEDs, is lifetime on blue. And uh, this, this really needs to get addressed. So if we, I'm not, I'm not a display manufacturer, so I don't know exactly what the requirements are, but assume it's LT95 of about 30,000 hours. But these things are all reported in LT50, so assume that's you know, 20 times that. So that's around six, 600,000 hours. So that's somewhere up in the black bar above the slide. And uh, you, know, you can see that blue and green, they're, they're orders of magnitude from where they need to be. So this, this is the problem that's holding this technology back from commercialization at present. So let's, let's go into a little more detail on that. <clears throat> let's talk about some of the, some of the factors that, uh, that people typically discuss when when trying to determine what the problems are. So one of the issues is charge buildup at interfaces and that lead to material degradation. This is a commonly cited uh, problem. And one, one issue with this is the uh, ligands are basically, these things on the outside of the quantum dots are basically insulators. And uh, you don't think Charge is a big deal in, in these things. They're only operated at a couple of volts, but one thing you may not realize is these things are only a couple hundred nanometers thick. So the, the, the actual field is extremely high. And so if you have, you know, an insulative region, you can have local areas of even higher field. And this is, this is particularly potentially a problem. Uh, we talked about the, you know, lack of the right types of charge transport layers. Many of them aren't solution processable, of course. For quantum dot LEDs, they're all solution processed. There's no way to evaporate them. There's no equivalence. And this is one of the benefits that I think I forgot to mention earlier on when I introduced this, is that QLED or QDEL technology is by definition printed technology. So it's going to be cheaper in the end, but we have to work out all of the issues with, with printing. A lot of groups are working on this. Photochemical and electrochemical reactions also something. Some of these materials that are used in quantum dot synthesis are charged. They can migrate under field. Hot charge to Auger process, I'll talk about that separately. Interfacial and morphological effects. Quantum dots aren't a evaporated, perfectly thin, uniform layer. They're a bunch of ball bearings stacked up uh, in a monolayer form, maybe a couple of monolayers. That's, that's the emissive layer. So 
how charge transport occurs through that is probably somewhat different than it does through an evaporated layer. And then the usual thing, contamination and impurity and environment, these also uh, aren't anywhere near as worked out for these types of materials as they are for the analogous uh, OLED materials. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, I, I think the short lifetime is, is, A, it's not well understood, and uh, this, is, this is the big problem to solve in this field. Uh, we talked about the band offset, you know, and getting the right charge transport materials. Uh, there's also issues of photophysics, which I'm going to go into a little bit as well, that can lead to damage and uh, try to put some of those factors in perspective as well. The first one being field-induced quenching. This group published this a few years ago, but if, again, we talked about the high, high uh, fields that are present in these devices, and quantum dots aren't exactly small molecules. They're larger, and we talked about excitons being present. What is an exciton, again, for review, is it's an electron in a hole uh, in, in these, and they, they aren't just discrete entities. These are wave functions. These are, you can calculate where, what the electron in a hole wave function would be in a, in a, in a, in a particle put them in a field, and then what, the, what these groups showed very nicely is, as you increase the field, you separate the electron and hole wave function. They don't overlap as well, and therefore you get what this field-induced quenching. What happens is the radiative lifetime gets longer and longer the higher the field. And so if, if the radiative lifetime is getting longer, all the competing forces are more likely to occur. So this is something that definitely occurs in devices. We don't know to what extent this is actually impacting performance, but uh, certainly is not a desirable thing. So uh, one wants to maintain the field uh, you know, as much as possible by uh, device optimization. <clears throat> very recently, um, the Sargent Group at the University of Toronto uh, published this very interesting paper where they showed the importance of ligands on the quantum dots. So in this uh, JVL diagram on the right, you see the same quantum dots with organic ligands and with uh, inorganic ligands. So they took the organic, these hydrocarbon-like ligands off of the dot, replaced them with chlorine atoms. So basically, they, they have an entirely inorganic system. What they found is that the mobility goes up almost a factor of 10. And furthermore, the same, same device, same structure, just the modified QDs, uh, basically increased the current density to about three amps per square centimeter, and they got almost a half million nits out of it. So, I mean, it's a huge change, and this just really underscores the importance of managing all the factors in the device, in particular mobility and the impact of, uh, you know, ligands and, and their impact on field strength. Another commonly cited issue with, uh, with, with uh, quantum dot electroluminescent devices is this Auger effect and formation of pi excitons. <clears throat> we already talked about what happens when an exciton forms, and if the electron in the hole, shown in you know, uh, uh, red and green, uh, recombine and you get light, well then that's what's supposed to happen. But under conditions of high injection, whether it's light or charge, it's possible that before that recombination occurs, another absorption can occur. And if that happens, you form a pi exciton. Well, what can still happen there is you can get light emission, but that's not the probable thing because that emission takes about 10 nanoseconds. But a competing, uh, if, uh, a competing process takes about 100 times less time, so it's much more probable. And that's called Auger recombination. What happens is one of those electron hole pairs recombine, but the energy isn't given off as light. It's given to the other electron, or possibly to the other hole, but let's just talk about the electron. And in this case, you have the case of, of the, uh, the third column here, where it says charge QD. Well, it's not charged yet, but if you look at the, the band farthest to the right, if you look at the, the, the indium phosphide green, that green area, that's the band gap of the green QD. Now, if the electron has twice that energy, it's only about a half an EV from vacuum. Okay, so it has a lot of energy, and it can probably now, it, there's a probability it'll escape the quantum dot entirely. And if that happens, now you just have a hole left in it. It's charged, and now the QD is non-luminescent. So this is why this effect is important, because it can lead to blinking or just basically a turned-off dot. And until that QD loses its charge, it won't be emissive. So this is an important effect. And a lot of people have, uh, have, looked, at, have looked at this. A lot of people have studied this, the, all the fast spectroscopists. 
uh, we're less sophisticated. We looked at this. We know a lot about photoluminescence, so we, we did some calculations. Uh, we, we understand our red and green quantum dots very well in, in, um, in quantum dot enhancement film where we stimulate them with photons. So we try to compare, okay, how are, we, how are we stimulating these with charges compared to how we do them, how we do it in the case of QDEF with light. So we looked at the number of quantum dots per square centimeter, the, the luminance level of these two. We try to take everything we could into, into, into account and we come up with the conclusion that, um, you know, in these emissive devices, they're working 10 to 20 times harder than they are in the photoluminescent case that we, uh, that we were, where we were normally using our dots. Okay, so 10 or 20 times, that's definitely, they're, they're cycling faster, they're working harder. <clears throat> so then we're trying to figure out, how, how, is that a problem? So we tried to calculate the maximum exciton rate that we would think wouldn't lead to multi-exciton effects. That's a little bit problematic, but we can measure the fluorescence lifetime and we can assume, okay, let's take 10 or 20 times that to ensure that all of the, all of the, uh, all of the excitons have relaxed back to the ground state, have recombined. And when we do that calculation, we still see that the, uh, where we'd expect to see beginning of multi-excitons forming are still 100 times higher than the current, than, than, the, than the, the rate they're being used in these devices. So we actually don't think that's a primary problem. We, we, we believe that that's occurring, but we don't think it's a primary problem with, uh, with these devices today, at least uh, under the way we're, ways we're operating them. Now, there's limitations to this uh, calculation. It's, it's definitely an approximation, but um, it's, uh, it's, it's sort of our perspective today that this isn't the dominant problem. <clears throat> okay, and uh, I mentioned a few times, maybe not enough, that uh, it's, you know, this is printable technology, and a lot of people have invested time in that. As early as 2011, a group at Samsung showed some very nice uh, color displays based on transfer printing. Again, you can, printing is a general term. There are many ways to, to print and, 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 in fact, print quantum dots. Some of that work was extended upon by another Korean group in 2015. And then uh, last year, um, uh, TCL group uh, print, uh, published some uh, uh, inkjet printed uh, full devices. So a lot of people are looking at printing of quantum dots because, A, you have to do it that way, and it's a much cheaper way to manufacture. So I think this is, uh, this is gonna be exciting development, not just for the, electro the photo emissive technology that I described earlier, but also in this uh, quantum dot electroluminescent case as well. And probably the best demo was shown last year here by BOE, and uh, they basically made two inkjet printed quantum dot displays and they had them in their, in their booth. And uh, I mean, it was, they, they were a little bit basic, and you know they didn't have great stability, but it was an amazing achievement, and uh, I think and they won best in show for that uh, that demo as a result. So we'll have to see what they have have next year. So what's next for quantum dots? This is harder. Um, the 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 rapid the rapidity of, of innovation on the materials is much much different pace, much much slower than it is in uh, in uh, you know, displays and component architecture and so forth. Uh, you know, A, I think there's just so many more people working in industry on these things. And, uh, and, and secondly, the problems are basic science problems in a lot of cases, like, like we talked about with the uh, quantum dot electrolytic EL devices. People still don't understand exactly the mechanisms that are, are limiting the performance. But Anyway, I, I still I think it's important for me to try to present what I think are the exciting developments that I see for new materials. And, uh, you know, regardless of whether on the horizon next year or in 10 years. So what's out there today? One is uh, lead perovskites. This is, this is pretty interesting materials, not really known much more than a, a decade ago when they started to be used in, in photovoltaics. And at that time, they've since then, they've gone from 4% to over 20%. That's incredible. No, no semiconductor material has ever been, you know, seen that type of progress in, in, in photovoltaics or, for that matter, any other type of, uh, of implementation so, so rapid. Um, I've seen films made of these. They have promising single light conversion. It's a little bit different. These, these materials are sort of ionic, and so there, there's issues 
it would be a little bit challenged to mix them to make like a red green film <clears throat> with them, but um, you know, they're quite impressive actually. Uh, problem is, obviously, they contain lead, and that's also a restricted material. So if you want to go to heavy metal free material, lead perovskites probably aren't your choice. Similarly, um, prob I mean, of all of these, I think this middle one is probably the most in interesting. These 2D materials that have emerged um, have absolutely in just stunningly interesting uh, optical properties in terms of absorption, emission. Uh, basically, they're extended materials. With the case of cadmium selenide, they call them nanoplatelets, but they're also called nanosheets, nanodisks. But they're extended in the XY direction, but they're still quantum confined by the thickness. And so they're only a couple of, a couple of atomic layers thick, but that still uh, confines the, uh, the excited state. And they've made materials with this, tech, tech, this sort of technology that's less than 10 nanometers full with half max. Incredibly sharp emission spectra. Of course, as usual, they're de demonstrated on the most ubiquitous material system, cadmium selenide, cadmium sul sulfide. So they have a huge amount of cadmium in them. But I think this could be extended to other systems. And uh, copper indium sulfide, selenide, this is the only sort of heavy metal free system that I've shown up here. They're out there, they've been out there, um, and they have pretty good emission properties, but they have, from the point of view of quantum yield, but not from the point of view of breadth of, of the emission spectrum. It's, you know, getting close to 100 nanometers. So for display use, that's not very exciting. So the materials that are out there are out there, and for whatever reason, they all have some killer flaw in them. Um, so what happens if you want to develop a new emitter? Well, <clears throat> not easy. First thing you have to do is figure out something that emits in the visible range, so it needs to have a band gap so around two. Um, shouldn't have any toxic or heavy metals because we don't like those, they're regulated. Uh, there needs to be a shell material available for it, so there has to be something that's, that you can grow on top of it that has a higher band gap. Um, one of the solution synthesis is possible. It's, it's all well and good, but if you have to make them on wafers, it's not going to be uh, affordable. And they have to have great optical properties. So here's sort of one snapshot of this that I don't want to overemphasize, but if you, on, on this graph is shown the lattice constant, that's the the size of that, of the lattice of the material shown on that, and the band gap on the left. And so if you look between one and a half, two and a half electron volts on the left, and you go across, and you eliminate all the ones that are red, because those have heavy metals in them, you see there isn't a lot of materials to choose from. They're just, you know, nature hasn't provided that many. Now there are materials that aren't on this. This isn't comprehensive, all semiconductor materials. But it really shows that they're, you know, you're, you're kind of limited. A lot of the semiconductors uh, that have been discovered just do have heavy metals in them. But there are a few. There are, high, uh, well, what I'll call antimony and business, bismuth perovskite materials. These are similar but not actually perovskites, but they're very much like the lead materials that we talked about earlier. They look like they could have interesting properties. They look, they're, they're tunable, they have high radiative rate. Um, but the, the PL efficiency is pretty low right now, below 50%. So, and nobody's really figured out how to stabilize these materials yet. But, you know, I think these have promise, uh, I think, as, as emitting materials. Cadmium-free two-dimensional materials, I'm very excited about that. I think these are a ways off, but um, there are people working on them. I think my guess as the best candidates today would be molybdenum and tungsten selenides because they have appropriate close to appropriate band gap, and I think, uh, you know, I think they, they could be used for this. And then something that people really, for the most part, aren't working on, <clears throat> nitrides. What, what is a blue LED today? It's indium gallium nitride, and this would be the ideal material, it would seem. Uh, problem is there's no solution phase synthesis for this. So this is what's, you know, really needed is a way to make nitrides. And, you know, there are people looking at this from a couple different angles, but again, I think this is a little ways off. So I think from the point of view of new materials in displays, um, you know, other than variations on the current themes of the cadmium, zinc, selenide, sulfide system and the indium, phosphide, zinc, selenosulfide sulfide system, that's pretty much it for at least the next few years, unless, unless there's a big surprise invention. So, with that, I will conclude.
So quantum dots are now you know, three decades into this, and they've really made a commercial impact in the display area. I think that's the one place where they have really shown. I mean, no pun intended. I mean, they've, the other application areas have, are, exist, but they really haven't gone mainstream. And at least LCD and backlight right now are mainstream for the wide color gamut market. Uh, you know, I talked about a number of additional architectures that I think will improve you know, efficiency and the utility and ultimately the color gamut of, of the display. But, you know, a number of improvements still need to be made for these materials to reach their, their full potential, uh, you know, specifically in the quantum dot LED case. Um, more study, no, more fundamental study is needed as well as more new material development to support it. And finally, I think, um, you know, I don't think there are any new material, you know, quantum dot materials that are right around the corner. So I think we have to really understand the materials we have and figure out how to make them uh, work the best they can possibly, possibly work. So with that, I'd like to uh, thank you, and I'd be happy to take questions from, from the audience.